Well, good afternoon, good evening, and good morning, wherever you are in the world as we celebrate this wonderful occasion of the International Moon Day, which is today is the 17th and or 18th, depending on where you are. And that event is coming up just officially on a couple of days on the 20th. I'm Doug Stewart. I'm a documentary filmmaker. I made a film called Chesley Bonestell, A Brush with the Future. I had some wonderful help especially from the gentleman you see below me and the picture here, that's Ron Miller. Hello, glad to be here. <laughs> glad to be here, not on the moon. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Well, um, I'll show you a picture of the poster of the film and then tell you a little bit about I how Ron got involved. That's what uh, I will do here. Okay. All right. Yeah. Here's our. This is the poster of the film that I produced, wrote, and directed, and I did it with the help of some really an incredible team of people. Uh, one of my first contacts was Ron Miller. Ron uh, is the author of a wonderful book. He co-authored it with a number of people called *The Art of Chesley Bonestell*. And uh, my interest in Chesley Bonestell was really nothing more than a couple of books that I had and I'd seen his paintings all through my teenage years. And I kept thinking as I pursued a career in show business um, and the career included work on the Oscar show and uh, the Screen Actors Guild Awards and the American Society of Cinematographer Awards. I, I did an awful lot of biographies and documentaries um, that eventually led me to the big question, has anyone done a, a, a documentary on Chesley Bonestell? And I looked and looked, and uh, as part of my research, I came across this book, and uh, Ron Miller's name was prominent on a lot of blogs, and so it took a little trouble to find him, but I did find him, and I called him up and told him who I was, and I asked the important question because I figured if anyone would know, Ron would know whether anybody has done a film on Chesley, and the answer was no. And the important question again, is anybody doing one? And again, Ron said, no, it's time to do one. You should do it and I will help you. And lo and behold, three and a half years later, we have this wonderful award-winning film called Chesley Bonestell, A Brush with the Future. And the film has won a, a number of awards. It's really great that it um, took an award at the Newport Beach Film Festival at the Boston Science Fiction Film Festival, and then was awarded Best Documentary at Comic-Con in San Diego. So we're all very proud of the audience that's seen this film and the awards that we've garnered. And um, I'll mention it later on, but this film actually, is you can see it out of this world. It's on the International Space Station that was sent up there a few years ago and put in the library for the crew to see. So, um, I think one of the big questions people may have if you haven't seen the film is who is Chesley Bonestell? And I'll let Ron take it over and talk about who Chesley was. Well, Chesley Bonestell was a lot of things. Uh, it's hard to point to him and say he, had, he was this or he was that. He uh, uh, trained as a classical painter. Um, and uh, studied architecture and went into architecture in the form of both a designer and a, um, an architectural renderer. An architectural renderer's job is to take the plans and, and ideas for a future building and do a painting or a drawing that shows the client what the finished building would look like. Um, one of his earlier jobs was uh, working on the Chrysler building. Uh, on the left there is, a, uh, is the painting Bonestell did to help sell the project to the client. Um, and Bonestell was also responsible for designing part of the film, uh, part of the building. And that was its famous uh, eagle gargoyles um, that you see up on the, uh, right up here, you can see some of them right there. And this is, this is his drawing of, uh, design drawing of the gargoyles. Uh, he went on to work on a lot of things. Um, 
the restoration of uh, San Francisco <clears throat> after the earthquake, um, the, uh, 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 the uh, uh, Plymouth Rock Memorial, uh, many other uh, iconic um, buildings of American architecture and history. Um, perhaps the biggest thing he worked on was the Golden Gate Bridge. Uh, he was hired to do a whole series of uh, paintings, drawings, um, basically to show people who are going to back this thing, the, the financiers, uh, who didn't understand engineering, and who didn't understand how such a, build, uh, a bridge could be built. And it was his job to show how this thing would go together, how it would actually be constructed. And um, this is one of the paintings he did back in the uh, 1930s to help sell the Golden Gate Bridge. And, he was reunited with this painting uh, not too many years before he passed away. Um, um, uh, well, this this me, photograph, but... yeah, I'll jump in here. But, this photograph, first off, let me yeah, back You, you do the tell the story. Yeah, well, no, I, the, uh, Chesley was born in 1888 in San Francisco and he died in 1986. He was 98 years old and he did have an incredible career that included working as an architect and art, artistic yeah. renderer on the Chrysler building and also on the Golden Gate Bridge. We're going to see some wonderful photographs by a gentleman who just passed away. His name is Bob David, Robert E. David, and he worked for the um, Golden Gate Bridge Authority. He found a whole bunch of these paintings and uh, in, in the archives and under, under the bridge and all that and wondered what, who they, what, what they were and all that stuff. And he did a lot of research, but he eventually gathered up the paintings when he found Chesley was still alive, living in Carmel and took them down to Chesley's house. And this is one of the photographs that uh, Bob took uh, and one of the paintings that he brought, he's put it on Chesley's couch. And this was the first time in 40 years that Chesley had seen these particular paintings. Uh, Chesley is actually in a good mood. <laughs> you, you may not be able to tell that from the picture, but um, <clears throat> he <clears throat> didn't smile very much, but this is, he was elated to be reunited with his, picture, his paintings and to see how wonderful they, they really were. Um, Chesley, after working on the Golden Gate Bridge when it was opened in 37, uh, he did travel down the coast to start work as a matte painter, a special effects that's artist so. at the studio. That's, that's yeah. the next thing. So that's the, uh, uh, yeah, well, Bonacel brought his, his skills as an architectural render, which involved, you know, being able to realistically depict, you know, uh, buildings and structures and proper light and shadow and perspective, which is exactly the sort of skills that are required to uh, create a matte painting. Uh, for a motion picture. What a matte painting does is it replaces a scene in a movie with something that really isn't there. Uh, say if you need a castle, you don't have to build the entire castle for the movie, you do a painting of it and just build a door or, or a road approaching the castle. And it saves a lot of money and uh, allows a lot of freedom to do uh, you know, fairly amazing things. And uh, this is Bonnestell working on a matte painting. Uh, I think it was for Warner Brothers. Uh, that's an unknown, it's an unknown uh, pay, uh, uh, film. I don't think anybody's identified it yet. But it shows him at work uh, in, the, uh, in the early 1940s. So it's a very early Bonnestell, uh, uh, his uh, first job as a matte painter. Um, yeah, they took, after the Chesley, another matte painter artist finished the, the painting, they would send it to the optical laboratory where it was brought into the film. Yeah, well, and, sometimes it was done that way. Sometimes it was a glass painting. That's right, it's a, exactly. Where it's on a huge sheet of glass. You just shoot right through the glass. And there'd be a little clear area where the actors would appear. So it'd be like, a, you could do it in one shot, which is, a, which is amazing. <laughs> then the sad part would be, of course, that glass was expensive. So they'd scrape the paint off after they were done with it and recycle the glass. So there's probably a lot of beautiful uh, Chelsea Bonas on that paintings that, that were lost that way. One of his first jobs as a mad painter was uh, working on Citizen Kane. Um, all of the scenes of you know, early Chicago and, and, and early New York. Um, 
uh, were, were paintings by Chelsea Bonnesell. Um, the great scenes of, of uh, John Foster Kane's Xanadu in the film were Chelsea Bonnesell paintings. This is one of them. Um, so he, he was able to bring his uh, skills as an architectural render to bear on doing these beautiful, realistic paintings. This fit beautifully into the film. It's, it's hard to tell you know, where the real action leaves off and the Bonnesell painting begins. Another film he worked on was um, Boris, uh, sorry, <laughs> Charles Lawton's um, uh, Hunchback of Notre Dame, for which he had this enormous painting. Uh, this, this, this slide hardly does it justice because they were able to, they were able to zoom in, you know, to, to, to Charles Lawton, you know, on, on, you know, it's sitting on this little on the balcony and it, uh, it's a beautiful painting. It's, it's probably on the glass and it's, it's probably lost. Uh, Oh, here's here's Bonnestell in his studio. He was probably in his late 80s or 90s when this photograph was taken. Um, uh, Bob took this picture, didn't he, uh, uh, Doug? Yes, this is a Robert E. David photo, Doug? which we're very fortunate. To I be thought able. so. Yeah. Yeah. So, no, that's because there's a Golden Gate Bridge book here in the foreground. That's what made me, <laughs> made me wonder for sure. Yeah. Um, well, the, all these are reasons why you should go see the film. It's available through our website, chesleybonestell.com. And it'll take you to options for a DVD purchase or Blu-ray or streaming. And uh, this particular photograph is explained in the film because Bob David brought one of the paintings from the Golden Gate Bridge archives that Chesley had not signed. And this is him signing that painting 40 years later. So it's pretty, pretty epic. So Bonestell, from the get-go, since he was a since he was a kid, um, uh, was fascinated with astronomy. Um, especially after a trip, <clears throat> a hike, I would say I should a trip, a hike to Mount Wilson Observatory, where he got to see Saturn through the Mount uh, Wilson Observatory telescope. Um, while he was working as a matte painter. He was doing paintings of scenes in other worlds on the moon, um, uh, the, uh, the moons of Saturn, and he had gathered all these paintings together. And they were a group of them were published in Life magazine. The uh, but they eventually made their way into this uh, seminal book, The Conquest of Space. It's really a book that launched hundreds of careers uh, and, and still influential to this day. It's probably the most important. Uh, volume of space art ever published. Um, this is one of the paintings is this beautiful painting of uh, Crater Theophilus on the moon. Um, he did moons of Saturn, he did the Mars in this book, but this is, you know, moon day. So I picked uh, a painting of the moon. Uh, up here, you can just barely see three or four little astronauts that Bonacel put in. Um, well, Life Magazine said they're just there for scale. I think Bonson put him up there because he was an optimist. He fully expected people to be standing there someday looking at this vista. Oops. And now it's time for uh, what this painting led into, which was Bonestell's collaboration with George Powell, the film producer and director, who saw this book and uh, had been starting work on a new motion picture called Destination Moon, that uh, he needed somebody who could, who knew all about the moon, knew all about astronomy, and was also an accomplished matte painter. And he found those kind of combination in Chelsea Bonestell. So um, we'll roll here a clip from Chesley Bonestell, A Brush with the Future. This is a section that deals with the movie Destination Moon, and it's told by a bunch of wonderful people um, who, really were influenced or knew Chesley himself as well. So Glavke, if you could run the first clip, please, of Destination Moon, that would be great. The popularity of the conquest of space also provided Chesley with larger, more creative involvements in Hollywood film productions. Bonestell designed a lot of the visions that went into science fiction movies. Uh, certainly one of the first and most significant was Destination Moon. Three, two, fire. 
Destination Moon was a very sincere attempt to show scientifically the first voyage to the moon. And Bonnestell consulted with scientists, technicians of the day, to get this as right as they could guess at the time. How are you, Mr. Bonnestell? Hello. I am told this is an authentic reproduction of what the moon looks like. Well, he is the man who knows how it really... I think he's been there. The, there's... Uh -huh. Have you, Chesley? <laughs> <laughs> Chesley did a series of background paintings for the film. In addition to this big backdrop mural, the whole lunar landscape, he created it as a T-shaped painting, so you could pan across it and look down into it and see part of the spaceship. And for us kids that saw that film, you know, the spaceship comes down landing vertically on the moon's surface. That was space travel to us. That's what we expected that we would be doing. There was such a total mystery about the moon back in 1950. We still believed there was a chance that when you stepped off your rocket ship, you would fall into a huge cloud of dust and sink out of sight. There was talk of seas of dust everywhere. And when they let their astronauts get off in the film, it did not occur that way. The fascinating thing about the film in many ways is how it predicted our actual landing. By the grace of God, and the name of the United States of America, I take possession of this planet on behalf of and for the benefit of all mankind. Okay, I want to tell you about some of the people that appeared in that clip that you just saw. Uh, we started off with Ben Burke. Ben Burke has a long, huge, gigantic career with Lucasfilm. He did all the sound design for Star Wars, the original Star Wars the cantina, and he's a well-deserved Oscar winner for his work. And um, also there was Don Davis. Don Davis is a space artist. And as a teenager, he um, went over to Chesley's house when he was living up in the Bay Area and uh, showed Chesley his paintings. And Don became the first and really the only artist that was ever mentored by Chesley himself. And that that's really something. And of course, then there's the great um, Ray Bradbury. And Ray Bradbury appears courtesy of a wonderful gentleman. He's a director named Arnold, Arnold uh, director and producer named Arnold Leibovit. And um, Arnold happened to have interviewed a number of people for a film that he was doing about George Powell. And this included wonderful remarks by uh, Ray Bradbury about Chesley. And um, the cooperation and help on this film was just fantastic. I'm very grateful to all of those people. So, uh, <clears throat> I guess it's my turn here. Oops. You have some. Uh, you have some other things connected with the with the destination moon that would be helpful. Yep. Hang on a second here. Uh, one second. <laughs> Got to push the right buttons here. Oops. Wait a minute. Slideshow. Start the slideshow. Here we go. There we go. Yeah, here's a couple of uh, just little, little items from the um, from the Destination of Moon uh, um, project. Um, up here on the upper left is a little uh, press book that was sent to theaters so they could you know, uh, print out ads and things, and information about the making of the uh, movie. And um, this, um, George Powell says on this little, little blurb, this is moon sets based on Bonnestell art. Probably no other living artist could have done these pictures, said George Powell. Mr. Bonnestell is as mathematics conscious as an astronomer or a physicist. He takes an artist's license, refuses to compromise with fact. His gifts, plus the art direction of Ernst Fecte, make a perfect team for this type of picture. And he did. Um, up here is a, a, a plaster model that Bonestell built just simply for reference purposes um, for working on the background of this film. This is the painting he did uh, that uh, Don Davis mentioned. And uh, <clears throat> the painting itself is 14 feet wide. Um, maybe an interesting detail though, is people don't realize is that when you see the earth in the sky in this, in this uh, panorama, it's a ping pong ball <laughs> and uh, glued to the background. So, it could, so they could, rotate the ping pong ball and make the earth go through the proper phases for the time uh, that they spent on the moon. So I thought that was a nice touch. I've actually seen that painting. It's in the collection of a gentleman named Bob Burns 
uh, this is a different panorama here, but um, uh, yeah, the, it, it's pretty extraordinary to see that painting and how it looks in the movie. So that's great. It's, it's uh, huge. Right. Well, so, one of the uh, things that this more or less led directly to was a commission from the, um, um, the Boston Museum of Science in, in Boston, Massachusetts to do a, a 50 or uh, 40 foot mural of the moon and set up so that when you uh, stood the proper distance looking at it, it was as though you were on the surface of the moon and the perspective was right. Um, everything was right. So you would feel as though you were on the moon. Um, uh, uh, sadly, this was put up in 1957, only about uh, what, 12 years later, uh, after the Apollo 11 landing, the, it was taken down. I think it was thought to no longer be accurate. Uh, we knew from the photographs from Apollo 11 that the moon doesn't look uh, as spectacular as Bonacel painted it, you know, with the rugged mountains and the peaks and everything. And uh, they took it down and put it into storage. And eventually it wound up at the National Air and Space Museum in Washington, D.C., where it sort of lingered, lingered for you know, decades. Uh, about 20 years ago, it was unrolled and inspected, and there was a lot of damage, you might expect. You were um, there, right? You were there. I was for the there. I was there when it, I was there when it's unrolled, and, the, <laughs> and it was unrolled on the floor, which is weird. You're looking down into the moon. You had to all the time want to hold on, keep falling into this painting because even with the damage, uh, it's spectacular. Well, fairly recently, um, the National Air and Space Museum decided to revamp its um, Apollo, you know, its Apollo Hall. And in the process, they've restored the, um, the mural. And it's going to be on public display again. I believe it, the hall opens this fall. Uh, I think it's not open yet, is it? It is on the, uh, scheduled for the fall. And interestingly enough, the whole exhibit, which is a tribute to the Apollo Moon Program, is called Destination, Destination Moon. Destination Moon. Yeah. And so. that's deliberate. It's a deliberate tip of the hat to the influence that the George Powell and uh, Chelsea Bonacel painting hat on the development of, of space flight. And it was very important film. Right, we've, we've seen uh, pictures of the um, restoration. It's absolutely fantastic. They really did a fabulous job of- They did. It took, the, it, it took years it, to do it. It took years and comparison photographs. They were very meticulous about the exact shade of every color in the painting. That they were yeah, I, I, I got called several times uh, about uh, various details on the thing. Should, should this be this and should this be that? Uh, so um, I haven't seen the, rest the, the restored painting, the final version yet. I'm really looking forward to seeing it in place and seeing it for real. I, I've never seen it up on a wall. No, very few people have. <laughs> so yeah, people are still alive anyway. Well, um, with that, um, the painting that you are referring to is called A Lunar Landscape. And we have a little clip from the film, which Golovsky will run about the lunar landscape. In 1956, Chesley was commissioned by the Museum of Science in Boston to show the public what it would be like to stand on the surface of the moon. Back then, satellites and space probes existed only on the drawing boards. So Chesley used the best available scientific information to paint a 10 by 40 foot lunar landscape. A museum press release announced to the public that no spaceship reservations are needed for a startlingly realistic visit to the moon. The exhibit was incredibly popular. And we'll be able, to, of course, to see the uh, restored version this fall, hopefully. And um, that's going to be pretty exciting. And I think all of us on the Chesley Bonestell film team are going to make the migration to Washington to see it. So. Um, well, um, we, uh, Chesley became instrumental in the formulation of our space program through his association with a gentleman named Werner von Braun. And to tell you more about it, here's Ron. Yep, hang on one second. <laughs> I have to go through the little uh, 
dance here. There we go. You know, the, as, as with the uh, link from Life Magazine to um, Conquest of Space, from Conquest of Space to George Powell, from George Powell to uh, the Hayden Planetarium, one thing led to another. And all these things eventually led to a collaboration with um, um, Werner Von Braun. And this was a massive um, symposium um, coordinated by Collier's Magazine, which was a huge magazine at the time, this you know, million circulation. And they brought together experts from every field of uh, astronomy and astrophysics and, and uh, space exploration and rocketry. And the whole thing was led by uh, Werner von Braun. And the idea was to present to the American public a coordinated space program. It began with a satellite and wound up with spacecraft going to Mars and was on step-by-step -step and using only technology available in the 1950s. They didn't invent anything. And this series is credited as being instrumental in jumpstarting the American space program because it convinced the American public who would be paying for this thing that such a thing was feasible, that it wasn't something for the far distant future, that wasn't something out of strict, you know, pure science fiction or fantasy. It was technologically possible and it, it could be realized in the immediate future. And you know, it raises me, you, you mentioned when Bonacell was born, you know, 1888. When Bonacell was born, you know, the Wright brothers were only teenagers. Uh, Robert Goddard, you know, who built and launched the first liquid fuel rocket was still in grade school. Um, and Bonacell was born when these people were, you know, hadn't even built the first airplane yet or launched the first rocket. It became eventually instrumental in taking part in the launch of the American space program, which is an amazing span of years and a span of you know, a career span. Uh, since, since we're talking about the moon and this event, um, this was part of the Collier's uh, space program. This was the um, uh, Von Braun's really monumental plan for exploring the moon. There were several of these vast spaceships. They had a crew of about 40 each. You know, so three astronauts, he had 40. These mammoth spacecraft. Uh, they were launched from um, the scene of a space station. It's an orbiting wheel, which we'll talk about later. This is a very, very important design. Uh, here's two space shuttles that were carrying supplies with the space station and, uh, and to the spacecraft. Well, some of those are the lunar landers, right? All, yeah. all, 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 all three of these are lunar landers. Uh -huh. um, two were return spacecraft and one was simply for supplies and equipment and, and you know, held, the, held the, uh, the habitats and the uh, space and then the tractors and, and everything. So. It was it was monumental. I guess probably the best word for it. And, and um, I should add, Ron, that before you uh, that the, the von Braun's plan yeah. was actually being echoed in the Artemis program, and uh, with Gateway, which is uh, um, basically it's a trip from the Earth to an orbiting platform around the Moon before descending to the Moon and also going on to Mars later. So. The, the vision of uh, Werner von Braun is pretty incredible. And of course, we, we would be remiss if we didn't mission, mention what a, he was a controversial person. He was brought over from uh, Germany after World War II, strictly because of his expertise with V1 and V2 rockets. And the V2 rockets became the, the testing pad for rockets that we would eventually design and create ourselves. In fact, like, like the Artemis you know, program, um, uh, Von Braun and Monastel, you know, preceded the landing with, an, uh, with a manned orbiter that simply orbited the moon, gathering information, uh, testing the conditions, looking for landing sites uh, long before you know, the, the landing craft were sent. Um, and uh, this, this is the Von Braun, Monastel. I, I call him the Von Braun Monastel because Von Braun actually considered Bonacell a collaborator rather than somebody, somebody, somebody illustrating his ideas. Uh, he'd get feedback from Bonacell about his own designs. You know, 
Well, as I was correcting Werner von Braun, <laughs> and von Braun said he, von Braun said he was actually terrified of Bonestell's intellect, uh, and, and, and but he was almost always right. So this was a, uh, and uh, once again, I keep keeping things going full circle back to the moon again. Uh, or this is this is this is, this is Moon Day. Uh, this is the ex exploration of the moon as. Uh, Readers of Collier's Magazine saw this in the mid 1950s. And um, they uh, got to see this beautiful, rugged, craggy lunar landscape that, as we know today, isn't how the moon really looks. And I think part of this was deliberate on Bonacell's part. He actually had information uh, uh, decades earlier what the moon surface would really look like. Uh, there's a, an artist named Lucien Rudeau who showed, uh, if you simply look at the moon through a telescope, look at the edge of the moon, you know, and he, uh, against the direct black sky, you can see the mountains in profile. But Bonestell chose to make these lunar mountains look rugged, uh, Dore-esque, you might say, um, and spectacular, because he, I think you knew if you made the moon look like it really looked like, it would be boring. And he's trying to sell the moon to a public. He's trying to sell the idea of exploring the moon. And I think the American public might have been reluctant to finance, you know, a billion dollar space program if they thought the moon looked like, you know, South Dakota. Uh, so I think that uh, this was very deliberate on his part. And um, I personally think if the moon didn't turn out looking like a Tesla Bonestell painting, it's the moon's fault, not his. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think uh, there's a statement that you're responsible for, Ron, called Chesley painted the moon like it should have looked like. Precisely. Mm -hmm. As it turns out, there are places in the solar system that look exactly like this. Um, the, uh, when uh, the recent... Uh, Comet lander. I, I can't remember the name of the comet. It's this really long thing. <laughs> uh, the Rosetta probe, uh, when it landed on, on uh, the comet, um, it took photographs that look exactly like Chesley Bonasol paintings, uh, landscapes just like this. So while you may not have gotten the lunar landscape right, there are landscapes like this in our solar system. So um, take comfort in that fact. Most of the photographs and films and videos of the uh, astronauts and exploration of the moon for landing sites all show rolling hills. They're very smooth and yeah. not not any any of this really the the dramatic craggy creek craggy um, features yeah. that these mountains have. That's really yeah. Uh, it did make it did, you know, the way the moon really is makes doesn't make it easier to explore. But I honestly think people you know American public seeing this in the 1950s found this really exciting. Some place they really would want to go to. And it looks like it's really worth it. looks exciting. It looks like the American, you know, uh, it's, it's much the same way that painters like Thomas Moran and, and Bierstadt sold the American public on the American West in the 1870s. You know, we, we, ha we have national parks like Yosemite and Yellowstone because of the paintings these people did showing the American public how spectacular the American West looked. And Bonacell did the same thing for the moon. He's, there's a, there's a famous uh, Robert Heinlein science fiction story called The Man Who Sold the Moon. And I think Bonacell had, the, had that role. He sold the moon to the American public. I think I put this particular opinion in also because I think it leads maybe to your next clip. Um, it does, so. but I, yeah, th th we, <laughs> we cannot underscore the impact that Chesley Bonacell has had on the uh, filmmaking styles of great and famous Hollywood directors. And uh, we're going to see a portion of the film that I made called um, Chesley Bonestell, Rush with the Future. But this is a part that, that deals with 2001, A Space Odyssey, which uh, thank goodness. And again, the, you'll see this part is hosted by the great special effects supervisor and director Doug Trumbull, who just also recently passed away. Uh, and he talks about the controversy that he got into with director Stanley Kubrick. So, and you'll have to remember the 
image of the space station that Ron pointed out, just to, again, as a reminder of the impact that Bonestell had on filmmakers. So Glofke, if you could run that clip, that would be great. Although Chesley Bonestell did not work on 2001 A Space Odyssey, his influence could be seen throughout the film. Douglas Trumbull, now an accomplished director in his own right, began his movie career working on 2001 in the special effects department. 2001 A Space Odyssey, which I worked on, had a big sequence on the moon. I was 23 when I started on the movie and I kind of worked my way up, but at the time we were making 2001, no one really knew what the lunar surface looked like and whether it was going to be powdery and soft. People didn't even know if you stood on the surface of the moon, if you just sink into it like quicksand. No one had a clue. So our job on 2001 was to try to figure out, well, what should the moon look like and how do we have a moon bus and a, a base on the moon that's going to be inside the Tycho crater. So Chesley's paintings were a kind of guide star for us in the making of the movie because he was the first person to actually envision what it would be like to be on the moon. During that process, working with Stanley Kubrick, there was a lot of talk about, well, are these going to be craggy mountains like Chesley Bonestell was painting, or are these going to be low rolling hills that I thought would be more accurate to what the moon would look like? So this was a big bone of contention between me and Stanley Kubrick. But I built this big model that was about maybe 20 feet by 20 feet out of clay on a big table on a stage and made a, a big crater and then smaller craters inside that. And then I went way up into the ceiling of the stage, 40 feet up, and started dropping stuff onto the model. Wet clay, water, marbles, pebbles, things like that, to actually create crater impacts naturally on the surface. But Stanley said, no, we're going to go for the Chesley Bonestell look because Stanley really liked the drama of craggy peaks and valleys and edges and things, whereas the model I built, which was very soft and sinuous like the lunar surface really is, was considered to be kind of boring and not very interesting to look at. So that's what you see in 2001, and that's one of the things about 2001 which is actually inaccurate. I'm so grateful to Mr. Trumbull uh, you know, it, we all make it look easy when we put films together, but I have to tell you, it's incredibly challenging. And that particular sequence was shot at his studio. He does not live in Los Angeles. He lived in uh, Massachusetts and took, took over a year to arrange the shooting of that. Uh, he invited me to come to his studio. He had his own film crew there. And uh, he opened up his archives of photographs. And that story that you just saw is part of the film that eventually emerged out of all the wonderful interviews that I shot. And I could not be more grateful. Um, so Ron, is there anything that you'd like to add about what we discussed before we move on to questions from the audience? Well, uh, uh, only that Chelsea Bonestell was the major influence on my career, probably any artist I've ever studied or learned about. I, mean, I do what I do today because of Chelsea Bonestell. Um, I first ran across him when I was in grade school. Um, all I knew was there was a good artist <laughs> who, who did these spectacular paintings. And I eventually learned this good artist had a funny name. And I, I deliberately searched out uh, books and magazines with his artwork in it. Um, and um, the stuff was so beautiful. It, it, was, it was like real postcards or photographs of, of, of these planets. And I... Um, Never thought about the possibility of making paintings like that of myself. It seemed impossible. <laughs> so it really wasn't until something Bonestell influenced himself that influenced me to try my first space painting. And that was when I saw 2001 for the first time when I was in college. And um, so I sat down then and did my very first ever space painting. So Bonestell kind of came in from several different directions for me <laughs> when I first started out doing space art. And to this day, my artwork is cons uh, considered by my colleagues to be Bonestellian, um, what they call rock and ball art. You know, there's this lot of rocks and mountains in the foreground and a ball in the sky. <laughs> so uh, I'm in the rock and ball school or the Bonestellian school. And you got to meet Chesley. Tell us how that happened. Well, it was through uh, uh, Bill Essler, who was 
Bonacil's manager at the time. Um, Bonacil never considered himself to be a fine artist. He was a, he was a commercial artist. He was an illustrator, and he attached no more importance to his artwork than that. It was disposable. Uh, but Bill Essler um, realized that there was a treasure there, and he convinced Bonacil to preserve his paintings, put them on show and display, um, have sales. He really revived Bonacil's career at the same time uh, as preserving it. So it was through Essler that I got to meet uh, Bonacil for the first time. Um, my wife and I went to San Francisco and went down to Monterey and visited him in his home and got a nice tour. And um, it's a, uh, it's still a, it was more of a pilgrimage, I think, than a visit. <laughs> so it was, uh, it turns out that uh, he was a very funny, sweet guy who uh, liked to pretend he's a curmudgeon, but you could see through him. Uh, he was he was actually a very, very, very nice man who I kept up a correspondence with and he uh, would encourage me on my artwork. Uh, I'd send him slides and he'd give me critiques and um, I, still, I still have some of those letters from him. So, uh, that, um, and to this day, I try to do paintings that I think would please him. So. Well, and you've written also several books on him as well. That's quite well, a two. I did two. Uh, Fred Durant and I did an earlier book called Worlds Beyond. And we did that when Bonacil was still alive. And um, so we got uh, some, somewhere there's a photograph of Bonacil holding a copy of Worlds Beyond. Uh, and I, I have a signed copy, of course. <laughs> and then after he passed away, uh, Fred Durant was able to obtain... Um, um, all of Bonestell's records, um, his correspondence, all his files, all his albums, and even the copyrights to about 137 paintings. And having all this material uh, enabled us to do a bigger book about Bonestell, a definitive one. That really yeah, told show, his entire show us life. Show a picture of that, yeah. Yeah. Us, you can show us the cover of that. Uh, well, I have to go up, do the share screen thing and everything, get back oh, and forth. Okay. That'd be a little, yeah. yeah. So we, they've seen it. They've seen it. It's in, it's in better used bookstores everywhere. <laughs> well, that's called The Art of Chesley Bonestell. Yes. And uh, I, the, the last time I checked, it, it, it's an out of print book, and but it's available in the new version, uh, meaning pristine condition for something like twelve hundred dollars so it's, no i uh I, I can't even afford a copy of it yeah, but there's I, i've been negotiating with some some places about doing a um a new version uh it wouldn't be a it wouldn't be a reprint be maybe a, a revised or expanded um uh, version of the book so i'll uh keep uh, everybody apprised of progress on that but it'd be a big expensive book to do in this day and age but um i keep trying yeah. All right. Well, maybe we want to go to the audience. Uh, Glavke can punch us into uh, anyone out there who has questions. And Ron, we will need to go back to the pictures that you have at some point. Yeah, there's Artemis coming up. Yeah. So, so, Glavke, are there any people out there who would like to um, ask questions about what they've seen and heard so far? Yeah, uh, we have a question from David Takemoto Rex. Uh, he asked, did Von Braun try, try to bring the, in bonus though, to help with the look of Disney three-part Man in Space series of the mid-50s? That was a big influence in me. Um, you want to try that, Doug? I, I didn't quite understand the whole question. Is that in the, is that in the, the chat part? In, in the Q&A uh, button below in the screen. Okay. Did Von Braun try to bring Bonestell to help in the, in the look of Disney's three-part Man in Space series in the mid-1950s? He was, uh, that was a big influence on me. Yes, um, at, that series was called Man into Space, and not to be confused with Men in Space, but um, that, uh, Dis the Dis people at Disney thought Bonestell was going to be too expensive so they never even contacted him from what I've heard. No. But you, you can certainly see his influence. Well, you can see his influence clear through it, but no, Bonasso had nothing to do with it, unfortunately. Okay. Great. Um, well, uh, are there any other questions, Lucky? 
Is there anyone that's you're going to Not take? Yet. Okay. Okay. Um, well, look, Ron. Let's go to the information slide that you have because I'd like well, to just. Well, yeah, well, you, <clears throat> yeah, you, you, you have. Well, I want to talk about uh, uh, um, Artemis coming up here. Which right. Is the next I, slide. I, was, I was. Yes. I was just going to. Okay. All right. Well, look. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, okay, uh, so here, here is a nice surprise. A wonderful turn of events has happened through the efforts of my associate producer, Christopher Darren. And uh, the Christopher has signed Chesley up for uh, several space adventures, believe it or not, through NASA's wonderful services they have where you can actually get yourself a ticket on board the Perseverance rover, for example. Chesley went to Mars, thanks to Chris's efforts. And um, either later this month or no earlier than the middle of August, somewhere in there, and again, it's all subject to change, but the Artemis I rocket is going to the moon and Christopher also got him a ticket. And so Chesley will be, there we go. Thank you, Christopher. This is a really wonderful, wonderful service that NASA has. Thank you for doing that. And uh, I think it's great that Chesley will- I like this part, boarding now. Yeah, boarding now. We're getting we're getting close, so that's pretty pretty amazing and uh, so much fun. And I really appreciate the creative spirit that brought this about. So, um, I also I'm, I'm looking at, I'm looking at this ticket really for, him for the first time. I like the mileage earned down in the corner, <laughs> one million three hundred thousand. <laughs> but there's no is this is this an aisle seat or a window seat? <laughs> Well, we don't we don't know yet, but also that QR code I didn't scan on that just to see what that would yield. But um, maybe one of the viewers can do that, right? So, or yeah, we can do it later ourselves just to see. Okay, and this is for all the talk that we've had about the film. Uh, you can um, it's available on DVD, Blu-ray, streaming, and video on demand. There's a great resource of sources that you can. Uh, used to see the film, go to our website at the bottom there, chesleybonestill.com, and uh, see whatever method you would like to look at the film. We do sell a lot of DVDs and Blu-rays, and the Blu-rays have some absolutely extraordinary bonus features. There are at least 80 minutes more of interviews with, there's Ron Miller does one, our other co-producer, Melvin Schutz, has one, um, Ben Burt uh, said to me during the filming, he said, just give me a Bonestell painting and I'll create some sound for it. And by Jove, he did it. And you, the only way you can see it right now is uh, as a bonus feature on the Blu-ray. So it's, um, and there's also a gallery of Bonestell's paintings, which leads to a question that people often ask, where can I see Bonestell paintings for real? And I can, I can say they're, they're at the Smithsonian. Um, there are several that they've got in addition to the lunar mural. That's going to be, hopefully they're going to bring all of their collection out to show. Uh, the Adler Planetarium in Chicago has a great number of Bonestell paintings, including one of his most signature ones, which I've used on the cover, uh, it's called Saturn is seen from Titan. I used it on the cover of the uh, poster. Perhaps Ron, you could call that up for a second. The, po the poster, uh, hold on. item number two. Yeah, wait a minute. Or, or one, I'm sorry. Wait, uh, hold, hold on, hold on, wait a minute. <laughs> it's number, yeah, it's number two. Yeah, hold on, I know, I have to get to it. <laughs> there we go. Um, okay, so this painting originally appeared in Life magazine and also in the book, uh, Conquest of Space. And it's called The Painting That Inspired a Thousand Careers. And Ron will tell you how it got that name. Well, for obvious reasons, really. Uh, it came out at the right time. Uh, you know, the, the, uh, uh, the 19th, well, it was first published in 1944. It was in the book. Um, Conquest of Space, where I think everybody has seen this painting, and um, it's hardly been out of print, you know, in the uh, you know seven years since. Uh, 
it was the right, the right age for a lot of people who were just then they were in grade school or high school and looking towards careers in science or interest in science and engineering and technology and astronomy, including Carl Sagan, who was inspired by this painting. And these people, 15, 20 years later, were graduating from college as engineers and as astronomers and astrophysicists, just when the space program was beginning and the Apollo program was beginning. Um, so yeah, this, this painting was, was literally one of the most important space paintings ever created. And um, requests to, pre, to print it still show up today, even though factually it's, it's no longer correct. We know Titan doesn't look like this. It's an opaque orange sky. But that doesn't matter. It's kind of like um, Bonnestell's moon. And the, it's not so much the accuracy that's important as its importance as, as, as something influence. It's, 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 it's inspiration. Uh, it's such a magical painting. Uh, you can sit there and look at this thing for hours and just see more and more in there. You want to you walk in there. And I think it was that confidence that Bonestell had, that confidence that shows in this painting that you could visit this place and you could walk on the, and those, in those snow drifts that came through, uh, that believability and that confidence that these places were real, that the, these are real landscapes that you could visit that influenced so many people and made this painting so important. And, and the cool part in our film is that Ron has provided these fabulous photographs of the clay models that Chesley used, the actual ones to create this painting. And uh, I, it, it was a real wonderful experience to be able to show people how Chesley created his art and you can see it too. Yeah. So, um, yes, you can. Yeah. Uh, anyway, um, Golovki, are there any other questions from anybody yes. else? Uh, okay. There are three more questions. Good. Lay them on us. Um, yeah. Did Bonas still have any work for the Forbidden Planet? Oh, that gets asked a lot because the background paintings for Forbidden Planet are these beautifully painted, towering, craggy peaks that look very, very, very Bonastellian. But no, uh, he had nothing to do with it. But I suspect, considering when the Forbidden Planet came out, which is just shortly after uh, uh, Bonestell's you know, Destination of the Moon and Conquest of Space and any space scene that didn't look Bonestellian that was, wasn't considered to be authentic. So once again, like, like 2001, uh, Bonestell didn't have a direct part in what the, what, the, what, the, what the background paintings looked like, but they were obviously influenced by him. Was there another question? Yeah. Um, I'm, not, I'm not seeing the questions here, unfortunately. Yeah. Art Curtis uh, writes, help me to better understand the part in the film where the hunchback of Notre Dame is shot in the painted background. Uh, you know, um, Art, I'm going to have to tell you, you really want to look at the film because we have uh, a, a pretty good explanation with visuals on that. And we also have some actual commentary an audio recording from Chesley explaining how he did that. Uh, but that was a massive painting. And we also, that segment is handled by the renowned special effects uh, supervisor, Craig Barron. He's an Oscar winner for his fantastic work. Yeah, in the, in the film, you have a clip showing how it appeared in the film itself, how it was used. Right. And that makes it much clearer uh, what Bonestell did. Yeah, but th that painting was massive. Uh, five feet by eight feet, or it was huge. And uh, Charles Lawton had to kind of crunch in there to, to be in the picture. So um, it's, it's pretty amazing. Uh, even, even if you look at it and know how they did it, you still can't figure out how they did it. So but that was a great question. Thank you, Art. Um, David takamoto Wirt says, uh, I saw a Bonestell exhibit in Hartnell College, Salinas in the late 70s. Also another show later at the San Francisco Academy of Sciences. Is anyone planning any new gallery shows? Love to hear 
uh, of one traveling around the US. Well, um, there are two major collectors who have the most paintings. They're no longer with us. And um, it, at the moment, no, but uh, stay tuned to our website because that would be the first uh, place where we would, if there is a traveling show, we'll put it on. Take it away, there, Ron. Well, there, there, uh, the Whipple Estate, who's one of the two collectors I just mentioned, has been beginning to loan out uh, the parts of their collection for exhibition. There was a big exhibit, exhibition in New Hampshire <clears throat> uh, earlier this year. So uh, there will probably likely be more Bonnesville exhibitions in the near future. And as you said, you can uh, put up announcements about that on the website. Yeah, that's, a, that's great. Um, <clears throat> Kenneth Saul writes, uh, in addition to your beautiful book, is there any way to purchase art prints of Bonnesville's paintings? Yes. Uh, I, I can <laughs> say if you go on uh, Google and look, there are some posters that are available. Well, be careful, actually. There's a lot of illicit ones on Google, if you just Google it, that, aren't, uh -huh. that really are not uh, really legitimate prints. Uh, Nova Space in, in Tucson, Arizona has licensed Bonnesell prints available. You have two of them back there in the background, as a matter of fact. But there's a lot of people pirating Bonnesell, and I wouldn't encourage anyone to uh, just go online and, and pick something at random because they probably shouldn't be there. <clears throat> but but no, no, Nova Space has, uh, and, and, bon, and, and uh, Bonnesell LLC also has a print available. So you go to bonnesellllc.com and uh, they have a print. Yes, uh, yeah, there are not many out there and Ron's point is correct, yes. There, I've seen actual posters, uh, legitimate licensed posters that have some of Bonnesell's work, but not much. Um, is, okay, John Sisson writes, is there a complete catalog of all of Bonnestell's space paintings? The answer is yes, there is. And that was compiled by our other co-producer, um, Melvin Schutz. And it's, a, it's called Chesley, a space, Chesley Bonnestell as Space Art Chronology. And uh, that's available on Amazon. And um, it's, it's an authoritative, very fine book. And you were gonna add, Ron. I was going to add that I, I also have a catalog I made of um, all of Bonnestell's artwork. Um, it's a little bit different than, 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 than Melvin's. Um, this is strictly a catalog listing by name, about 3,000 paintings. Um, but uh, it's not been published. So um, oh. but I can always make a copy for anybody who wants to see one. Okay. And also you can... Uh... Go to Amazon and order, or wherever you can order uh, Melvin Schutz's book. Yes, Jesse Bonnestell, a space art chronology. Yeah, it's it's every it's every Bonnestell space painting that ever appeared in print anywhere, and it's 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 it's, it's exhaustive and authoritative. And it's all space paintings. So, great. Um, hi, Kenneth, and hi, John. <laughs> so, uh, thanks. Those are all great questions, and. I have some special thanks. I, I have a wonderful team that includes Melvin Schutz, also our associate producer, Chris Guerin, and also our editor. And just, she takes care of everything. That's Christina Hayes, who helped make this event possible. But amazing. I need to, go ahead. I said the amazing Christina. She is amazing, yeah. Uh, I have miles of credits of people who helped on the film and you have to look at the film to see that. And I, again, it's the incredible cooperation of people who really appreciated who Chesley was that made that film happen. Um, I need to thank Dr. Nasser Al Sahaf. He's chairman of the International Moon Day Group. He's in Saudi Arabia watching this, we hope. And Golovki Antonio, she, you, she's been behind the scenes today. And she's secretary and media coordinator for the International Moon Day Group. Bernadette Deterra. She's the global network coordinator for the IMDG. That's the International Moon Day Group. And we were um, just continually tapped on the shoulder by Professor Madhu Thangavello, who teaches at USC, that's the University of Southern California, 
and he is the North American coordinator for the International Moon Village Association. So, and again, we, Ron and I would really like to extend our thanks to everyone at the International Moon Village Association who runs and staffs that whole event. Thank, Thank you. you. So much. Thank Real you. honor and pleasure to be invited and to be a part of your fantastic event. It's a great pleasure. Thank you. So, Wagowski, that'll be it. Thank you again. And uh, sure. go see the film. As soon as possible. Yeah. And, Ron, you can put up that information card to take us out. Yeah. Yep. Hang on. Uh, we want number 15. <laughs> this isn't as easy as I thought it was going to be. Yeah, wait a minute. Uh, there we go. Wait a minute. <laughs> Cleared out the far end here. And there we go. Yeah, we want number 13, please. Yeah, well, I know. Wait a minute. Okay, we're there. there. We're, what, what? Yeah, it's. Okay. Yay! Thank you. Oh, it's not cooperating. Well, it's not doing what it's supposed to do. It's, it's okay. Yeah, but it there never, it is. It always <laughs> works out that way. Yeah, I know. We're, everything was perfect up until this last slide. <laughs> no. Yeah. Nope. Well, but do see the film. That's... Um, pretty amazing and there if um there are questions that people have they can certainly go go to our website and send us a note and we'd be happy to answer them okay so that's it thanks again and